should be a pretty short video here today uh, as we're working into our third video on the European Renaissance. We want to talk a little bit about uh, writing of the Renaissance uh, that's coming out, particularly writing in the vernacular. We're getting what that means in a second. So we talked about Italian art in the next in the previous slide. And we'll get into a little bit of Italian writing uh, and some other writing of the Renaissance here on this PowerPoint. So with writing in the vernacular, Renaissance writers are adapting to medieval changes in literature. And so we'll talk about a couple of different guys in a couple of different ways here in a second. Uh, out of Italy, we have Dante Alighieri, who is the uh, big writer from Florence and spends a lot of time in there. His book is The Divine Comedy. Uh, this is probably one of the more famous books in Western civilization. Um, and the uh, This is a book in three parts, uh, The um, Inferno. Uh, Purgatorio and Paradiso, uh, and it describes the character Dante, uh, who is upset that his girlfriend has committed suicide, so he begins to go look for her into the afterlife. Uh, he goes, manages his way into the afterlife, and is guided by the poet Virgil, goes through the seven layers of hell in Inferno, uh, works his way through the mountain of Purgatory in Purgatorio, and then uh, his search continues into heaven in Paradiso to try and, and try to find um, his girlfriend. I won't, won't want to, one of the few things I won't spoil for you. Come to that. This book is a big deal in terms of the modern conception of hell comes from Dante uh, writing this book here. So the idea that the sins you commit on earth are going to be your eternal punishments and your eternal damnation in the afterlife that comes from dante it's his conception and the idea of the modern framework of what hell is comes from uh this book and dante's writing out of england we get geoffrey chaucer his book is the canterbury tales uh this is the, the, the it's, it's a frame story of a group of pilgrims working their way to our, on a pilgrimage towards canterbury uh, and, and then in there we get glimpses of what it's like to live as a knight we read the the knight's tale as part of the prologue to the knight's tale of the canterbury tales in your chivalry documents uh, there's the partner's tale. There's a couple other ones that I forget. Uh, the, the, that's all uh, what Chaucer's writing about. And uh, towards the end of the Middle Ages, we get Miguel Cervantes writing Don Quixote. Um, the big thing and the big reason these are all important is because all three of these are major works in what's called the vernacular. The vernacular simply is the native language. The big thing to understand here is the Divine Colony is written in Italian. Uh, Jeff Canterbury's Tales is written in, in English. Don Quixote is written in Spanish. It's not written in Latin and then translated to Spanish. These are works written in the native language. And just like how most of us at Jolie Catholic are taking a foreign language class, and when your Spanish or your French teacher says, hey, tell me what you had to do this weekend, for most people learning your language, you've got to sit and you got to think and your vocabulary is limited, so you're only able to describe what you did over the weekend in French or Spanish in a kind of a muted, uh, in a more simplified way. So, however, if I were to go and ask you, hey, what did you do over this weekend and you can respond in English, you're going to give me all these colorful details and be able to kind of go and give us the turn of phrases that we would understand colloquial here in English. So writing in the vernacular allows for more self-expression. It allows you to portray your individuality much better than what we would have had if you were going and composing in a language like Latin and then having to retranslate it and working for that. That's why those are big deals. Other famous writers who are writing not only in the vernacular but are, are important during the Renaissance include Petrarch. He's the earliest and most influential of the humanists. And he's very much known for his poetry and his letters that the philosophical idea of humanism kind of is built off of the intellectual background and writings of Petrarch. Giovanni Boccaccio is another famous writer who writes in the uh, vernacular. He writes the book The Decameron in uh, Italian. Uh, and again, like the Canterbury Tales, the frame story of the Decameron is a group of Italian teens have fled their city to go to the country house to flee the Black Death. And again, there's no PlayStations, there's no Xboxes, there's no Nintendo Switches, there's no Steams, uh, there's Steam Decks, what have you. There's no Pokemon cards. So they got to go and pass the time. So they pass the time by telling stories. And so it's a series of stories. Some of them are very realistic. 
Uh, some of them were fanciful, but we understand by reading this book today the humor of what thing, what people found funny and the jokes people found funny in the time period as well as what people thought were sad and were tragic during the time period and that's what Boccaggio's The Cameron offers us as uh, readers and historians today. On the my left, on the left here is a portrait of uh, Dante uh, and again his viewpoint in the Divine Comedy of what hell is going to be like is portrayed in a couple of couple, couple, things. This is Gustave Doré's uh, etchings that he makes in the 1800s for, for our work here. But the, the conception of hell comes from the Divine Comedy. So if we can see that this guy here, uh, he's got no legs, and this guy's head is not on his hand, it, it's here. So the punishment that these guys are receiving is they've killed or maimed or hurt someone during their lifetime so hell is going to punish them right by having their head chopped off every single day for all of eternity right uh we get different tutorials in this uh sales uh people who swear all the time who are having vile words and sayings come out of their mouth are going to spend all of eternity like these people submerged in a river of poop right um so i think this might be sharon uh taking them across the river sticks there's, there's Virgil and there's Dante there. But, but again, that's one of the more famous uh, in the work that I bring to show off at class. The kids want to see the river of poop. And then again, you've got guys who are, are going and being punished in other certain ways. This almost Sisyphusian task where they're pushing these boulders um, that we see in hell as well. And you can get, again, we see Dante and Virgil uh, being guided. See Dante and Virgil being here down to the lowest and deepest level of hell where a great beast, the devil, is there um, consuming uh, you and so this is the layer of hell reserved for the most vile and, and most terrible horrible traitors and backstabbers in all of history uh, so Cain is in there um, uh, Brutus uh, is in there and then there's a third guy who I forget uh, but they're going to spend eternity being chewed by the devil in the deepest layer of hell uh, I just found this recently, and I'm like 99% sure. If one, I know it's 100% it's not real, but I think this is AI, and I'm besides myself how I can't figure out how to make my own AI uh, Lego boxes. But I really want to do Once I do that, watch out for all the people uh, in my PowerPoints. But this is, again, uh, very much seven layers of hell. Uh, they kind of go and work their way in here uh, through Dante's Inferno. So I really like that picture, and I'm going to keep putting it in there just because I like it. Uh, Zephyr Chaucer here on the left, uh, he's going to go and write all sorts of different works, very famous English writer, uh, again, his most famous works is the uh, Canterbury Tales, and uh, as junior, sophomores, juniors, seniors, uh, you, you, you'll read this, or at least parts of it, uh, in your English classes. Here's Petrarch, his portrayal there, again, his writings speak very much form the basis of humanism. Uh, that's some of his writings that he's going and making there. And then again, we've got uh, Giovanni Boccaggio, and these are paintings from his Decameron story, which he, he's very famous for as well. The last writer we want to talk about is Nicolai Machiavelli, and his famous book is The Prince, that's written in 1513. Now, Machiavelli is very much a man of his time period and a man of his part of the earth. Remember, Italy is filled from heel to the opening of the boot in the Alps with different city-states who are all uh, politicking and warring and fighting against each other to become the top Italian city-state. So the prince is a guidebook for prospective rulers or for young rulers or people who want to gain power. And the essence of the story is that the key point that the key question Machiavelli is trying to answer is how can a ruler gain power? And once that ruler has power, how can he keep it from his enemies? Machiavelli's major insight that he's kind of working from is he says that people are selfish, fickle, and corrupt. So in order to be able to kind of use people against themselves or to be able to gain power from people, a prince must be able to, and this is a quote right from Machiavelli, 
strong as a lion, but shrewd as a fox. So we know lions, king of the jungle, big and strong. But it's not just to be strong politically, militarily, physically. You also have to be able to use that strength and more importantly, when not to use those strengths. And that's where the second part of that quote comes in is shrewd as a fox. You have to be smart. You have to be astute. It's not good enough just to be a big, physical, powerful person. You have to be able to know when to use that power or lean in that power and when to be able to draw on other skills you need to be shrewd so how does he succeed machiavelli says you shouldn't worry about what is morally right but what is most politically effective at the end of the day the question is how can a ruler gain power and machiavelli says does it matter how you gain that power the end goal is to gain that power so his famous quote, hints, winks, and nudges here, is the ends justify the means. The end result, power, justifies all the steps you took in order to reach that goal. Right? And so this means different things to different people. But again, you're, you should be familiar with this concept because most major bad guys in like Bond movies or in your Marvel movies, this is kind of what happens. This is what makes kind of the best villains is that in the villain's minds in your movies and your TV shows and your stories, they are doing what's right. But in order to get to what is right, they are causing problems that our hero, our Iron Man's, our Captain America's, our Spider Men and Spider Women have to be able to go and, and, and stop, to be able to go and do that. Uh, so the, the famous example I give is that Mr. Cranmer has the ability to end AIDS right now. Okay, you, you, you give me the the the, the the idea, if you give me the resources and the money I need, and I will go and I will wipe AIDS off the planet because AIDS only exists really in the blood of the people who are carrying it. It's a bloodborne uh, disease. Do that. So all you gotta do is test everybody on the earth, find everybody who has AIDS, and then give me a gun, put a bolt in the back of everybody's head, right? Shoot them off all in space. I don't know if you heard my clapping, but boom, I've solved AIDS. Okay. What is what was the means, the ends here? Well, it would be great to be able to get, not have AIDS anymore, right? But does the means, putting a bullet in the back of everybody's head, justify that ends there, right? Particularly with all the retrovirals and antivirals and other pills and medicines that we have today. I mean, doing this in 2023, is, is, is there's no reason to do that. You take a look like Magic Johnson, who's become a billionaire, right, after his playing career, which was ended because he contracted AIDS in the early 1990s. And so th that's the whole idea, is the ends of an A-plus in your classes, does that justify cheating and copying and doing all terrible, horrible things to get that A-plus? Right? And, and so th those are things you have to ask yourself, and this will come up a lot during your life, is does the end result justify the means getting there? Right? Does putting my body through all this stress and all this other stuff justify what I want in the end? And for some people, it does. And again, we hear this all the time at the Olympics, right? About the figure skaters who woke up at four in the morning every day and were at there and, and had missed all this, missed all that, but they end up with an Olympic gold medal. Does that gold medal, does that Olympic medal to skating at the Olympics justify all the things that you did on there? And some people will say yes, some people will say no. But again, that's what Machiavelli is trying to get at here and again this is a something that very much you have to ask yourselves um as you're living your lives uh and going forward victoria colonna is a famous poet uh who, who also writes uh during this time period as well uh, to give us some of these ideas from a, a woman's perspective as well so there's the uh first page to machiavelli's the uh prince uh, from from the t time period or very close to that, uh, you can buy this today for like a dollar from the Dover uh, Publishing Company. Uh, and make sure we understand this is a short book, 50, 60 pages, just a guidebook gets in there. But there's a lot of important words and ideas that are still being bandied about in the world today that come from what Machiavelli is trying to go and, and get at. And Machiavelli, very much someone saying, yeah, the ends do justify the means, so it doesn't matter. And whereas maybe other people might be saying, maybe not. But that, that's the point of view that he's coming through for when he's writing in his time period. And that's a poem by Vittoria Colonna, who's got her portrait there on the uh, right. One more uh, lecture and PowerPoint. 
on the Renaissance. We'll see how the Renaissance has moved out of Italy into Northern Europe, its influence on Northern European artists, and then we'll finish up on that PowerPoint with the printing press as well to end our study of the Renaissance and move into the Reformation.